episode of Whiskey Wednesday. We are here with Drew Mayville, Master Distil- Master Blender, sorry, for all of Sazerac. How are you today, Drew? I'm great. Don't get that title wrong. That's right. Harlan will be mad. That's right, yeah. Sorry, Harlan. Today we ha- essentially have a master class on how to taste bourbon like a pro. How to nose it, how to taste it. We've got some great tips for everyone at home. But first, Drew, I want to say you have one of the coolest jobs I've ever heard of. So what exactly does a master blender at Sazerac do? Well, first of all, um, I know I have the coolest job. And uh, basically, a master blender uh, ensures the consistency of our products that we produce. So a master blender and a master distiller work hand in hand in trying to make the products consistent over time. Also, Master Blender also develops new products, which is the exciting part for me. And Buffalo Trace has no shortage of new products. Um, We develop new products all the time, so that's really exciting for me. So those two aspects are really important. And both of those require lots of tastings. So that's what the session is about today, tasting like a pro. And the only thing I want to tell people is I have a big secret. We don't swallow. Even though uh, uh, most people who do taste, uh, especially outside work, uh, would spit. So we have these spittoons here. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't walk out the door at the end of the day. So the spittoon is what we do, is we spit. So no swallowing. So that's a tip uh, just for this group. Very cool. Well, let's let's jump right in then. What I'm let, excited. Let's, yes. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's let's talk about how to taste bourbon like a pro. So what I thought um, in terms of format, we talk about the glassware, the vessel, really important in tasting, and we'll talk about some simple rules, and then we'll get into the nosing techniques and tips, and then we'll get into the tasting techniques and tips. And I think we'll wrap it up with what we do here at Buffalo Trays for tasting, if that's all right. I think that covers a lot of bases, and I hope we have enough time. Otherwise, we ha- might have to make part two. So let's get right into it. So the tasting glass has changed over the years. It's become much more scientific. And what I have today actually is four samples of tasting vessels. So the first one is the Capita glass. You could see it's like a tulip shape. The second one we have is a Glen Karen, and I hope everybody can see that. This gla- next glass is called the Norlin glass. If you look through it, it's a double walled vessel, and it's kind of like insulated. The interior looks like a Glen Karen somewhat, except a little bit different design. And then we have the last one, which is called the Neat Glass. You can see how they're all, this actually looks like a spittoon a little bit. All of these have some positives and negatives. So if you think there's a perfect glass out there, uh, I don't think there is. I think it depends on the product that you're tasting, the proof, there's so many variables, and also your experience. But if you look at it, the first two, the first two glasses I showed you, they all are convergent. So the the top part, you can see how it's funneled towards its concentrating flavors. The same with the Glen Cairn. You see how it it's kind of a bulb on the bottom and it kind of converges at the top into a smaller diameter. Both are quite small in diameter. What this does is really focuses the aromas towards your nose. So there's pros and cons to that. So the pro is it focuses the aroma, it just concentrates them. But the con is you get more of this, what we call ethanol anesthesia. So it kind of deadens the senses because the ethanol or the alcohol is evaporating. So you kind of have both, but pros and cons, again, nothing's perfect. This is what we use here at Buffalo Trace, and it does focus the flavors. And one way that we've done uh, what most companies or most uh, blenders use is that type of glass or the Glen Cairn, is it focuses the flavors, but because of the alcohol, we reduce the proof. So usually this is around 20% alcohol or 40 proof. So we would add water to it. 
And so that reduces that ethanol, uh, uh, strength of eth ethanol. Whereas the second two here, you can see these two. The, the Norling glass actually, it flares out or it's divergent. And the same with this one. You see how it flares out instead of going and focusing. So the theory behind this and the scientific uh, explanation is that both allow the alcohol to dissipate more this way and allows the aromas to be center, front and center. And I, you know, you can actually do a test yourself with all these glasses and you can see actually that happening. I find with these first two that you really get that intensity that I'm looking for because I've been doing this now for over 40 years and I brought my picture today to show you. Some of you may have seen this before. This is back in the early 80s. So I have 40 years of experience. You can see even the glass, it's probably hard to see on the, uh, on, on the screen, but it's the same types of glass that focuses the taste or the smell towards your nose. But these two glasses will dissipate the ethanol so you won't get that anesthesia or that uh, burn on your nose as much. And the other thing, they're wider. The rim, as you can see, the diameter is quite wider than, say, with this glass. And so that makes a difference, too, on how you... So really, if you really wanted to smell something properly, you'd smell them with all these glasses and pick up a little bit different on each. But it's really a preference and what is good for you. And you'll have, hear people t say this is the best for them and this is the best for them. I think it's very subjective in some uh, way, but you could try it yourself and see what you think. So the other, the last point on this is that the shorter the vessel, like this one, you're closer to the heavier aromas as opposed to this one, which is tall. So there's quite a lit lot of scientific um, literature that you can go out and read on all these different classes and you can determine what's best for yourself. But it does influence the, the taste and the smell by using these glasses. That's a big subject. Um, a couple rules. Um, here in the lab, we, when we taste, we stay away from really spicy or sweet foods when we're tasting because that will affect your taste. So for me personally, uh, I like to taste the earlier the better for me as opposed to after eating and stuff because I think it dulls your senses as you go through the day but it really depends on the individual and whiskey in my view is perfect as it is you don't need to add water you can appreciate the whiskey as it is um, but you can add a little bit of water and most people I would recommend you just add a little bit like this just a few drops and that tends to open it up. But if it doesn't work for you, uh, you can add more water and it opens it up more. And there's less that ethyl, or the ethanol uh, anti uh, freezing of your nose. So you smell more of the flavors, the whiskeys. And if that doesn't work, what you do is you just go like this, pour it on your palm, let the alcohol evaporate and smell it off your hands. That's really cheap. There's no glasses involved. So, so there's different ways you can do that. Um, but adding water does open it up. It, it shows you other aromas. Um, but you'd really want to smell it first and then add the water and then smell it again. And it, here it's very important that we wear no perfumes or colognes. And anything fragrant that's perfumed like shampoo or deodorant we stay away from you have the uh, because that'll affect the smell in the in, in in the environment that you're smelling and tasting it's pretty important to be as neutral as possible and as a matter of fact our lab is carbon filtered and deionized and it's under positive pressure so all the smells from outside stay outside so when you walk into the tasting lab um, you have very neutral uh, odor and that's probably the best way. Now that's a little expensive to do at home, but do your best. <laughs> um, and when we do nose, another simple rule is um, 
no several times as opposed to just once. Um, sometimes the shock first just uh, acclimatizes your nose and then you um, smell again and you'll smell some odors you didn't and you do it again you see a little bit different. So, and that leads me into some techniques now in nosing. Now I've named some of these. Um, first one I would call, uh, well actually if you look at this picture, when you look at the nasal cavity, it's all connected with your mouth. So that's why it's important for me, I recommend strongly that you open your mouth a little bit so that it circulates and you really get a full appreciation of all the flavors and aromas that you're going to smell. The first technique though is called the ramrod. And that's really where you cram your nose into the glass and everybody, again it's subjective, everybody likes a different way of doing it. So somebody will just go like this. You watch people's nose and they just stick their nose in like that. And it's pretty strong, the ethanol, so you get that anesthesia effect. So some people prefer that. Um, some people do the drive-by, which you can really go quickly in and out of the glass. That's like a drive-by. You get different flavors from that. You can try all these techniques to see which one you prefer. And then there's the slow poke. So you just hover around the top of the glass. A lot of people like this one. And then slowly inch in. So you start, you smell the top notes and then you just gradually, gradually go in. And then there's the roll, the uh, barrel nosing. And I guess you can, um, figure this one out. You kind of go horizontal. This one you don't, I don't see a lot of people, so you kind of forcing the odor up this way, so you just roll the barrel, roll the glass, and you, you pick up the different aromas. You'd be surprised and slightly different. And then there's the round the clock where some people just rotate the glass. And there's many others Probably my favorite is the alternating nozzle technique. So, so the, I mean, alternating nostril, nasal. Um, what you do is, for fun, if you're at a party, you just go like this. You close one of your nostrils and you smell. And you try to determine some of the smells that you actually are smelling. And then you close the other one off and you can actually smell different aromas. And, and the theory or the science behind this is that your nostrils actually turn off and on. So one side is, is kind of closed. It reduces the airflow while the other one is open. And most people don't, I don't think they're aware of that. It's, it's part of who we are. And so, and the reason we do that is it's, it's automatic every two to four hours that happens. So one side has more airflow and the other side has less. And the theory is, I think, that it's re-moisturizing when it's closed because it's dried out from breathing. And so what happens is this side will be more sensitive than the other side. So you, some people can actually smell quite a bit different between the two sides. So the way I just do it is I combine the both and, and you just go smell it like you kind of tilt and you, and you nose like that. So all these different techniques depend on the person. It's very subjective. So there's no wrong answer because some people think that um, because you smell something, you should be smelling it too. And it doesn't work that way. It's a very complex um, system. Your body is very complex. And sometimes you can smell the blueberry character and some people can't. As a matter of fact, in the lab here, we have people who are very sensitive to certain characteristics and some that are sensitive to different characteristics. So when we're looking for something in particular, we'll use the sensitivity of the certain people for certain products. And it's just the way it is. You're dealt with, the, you know, by nature, your, your smelling capability and tasting capability. And I always say relax because um, a lot of people are tense when they're smelling and tasting. Relax and enjoy because there's a difference between drinking and appreciation. And I think drinking is that some people just want to drink it and feel the effects of the alcohol, whereas the appreciation, you can still drink, 
but you appreciate the flavors by slowly sipping. And so people always ask the question about, well, how do I know what that smell is or that taste? And you can go online. There's a, you know, probably 50 different whiskey charts. So you get, as an example, this wheel, you have spicy characteristics like pepper, but then you don't think about other characteristics that are spicy like ginger, vanilla. So this really prompts your memory when you actually look at it and you nose, and so you can start determining the different types of flavors. Another good example is the, uh, the fruity. You got the stone fruits, so in other words, plums and apricots. You hear that a lot in whiskey. You might have fruitiness in terms of uh, citrus. You might have people say lemon. Um, so that's really handy for you uh, when you're trying to determine different smells because sometimes it just doesn't come to you. And especially when you see it in a whiskey, they may be combined with other flavors and that's where it gets difficult. But the best advice I can give you is keep trying and experience all these flavors because you will get better at it. And a lot of people, even in bourbon clubs or whiskey clubs, will use these types of things as they get through and move through the process of learning about whiskey. That's a, that's a great tip, Drew. So, um, you know, we've got people tuning in from all over today as usual. We've got some, some folks from Montana and Jacksonville, Florida, um, South Carolina. So lots of viewers today. And, and well, we've, got a, we've got a great question um, from John Huck. He says, what's the best way to train your palate to pick up all the flavors and scents in bourbon? You just talked about one. Are there any others? Experience. Um, <clears throat> I think people have the lack of confidence when they're tasting. They actually can smell quite a bit. Um, but if you go through some of these rules that I talked about, the spicy food, you don't, you don't have a pizza and then go try and taste that's, you know, that's spicy um, or have an Italian meal or something. You do it you know, before or don't eat spicy food, you eat bland food. But just having that confidence and, and the way to get that is, is using a wheel, using friends in a bourbon club or a whiskey club and, or working here at Buffalo Trace so that you get used to all these terminology because that's really the hardest part is the terminology piece. Uh, but I, I can almost guarantee you, if you actually dig up a few of these off the internet, you will actually start seeing some of those characteristics. When I do my tastings, a lot of people, um, when, I, when I suggest, because it's very suggestive, when I say, well, do you see that grapefruit note? And probably 70% of the people will say, yeah, I see that, because they're, you're suggesting it's there. And that's why I say when your friends say there's a certain character, maybe to you there isn't. Um, so that's why the wheel really helps, really starts you thinking on your own. And one of the first things we do for our training here at, with new panelists is we just let them sit and taste without training them with anything, just so you get accustomed to the smell uh, of whiskey. And that, that, that goes on for several months before they can actually get trained. And also it determines how uh, devoted they are to this, which they usually are. But just getting accustomed to the smell, because once you start concentrating on the smell, you'd be surprised what you can pick up. That's a really good question. It, it does take some time. But use the tools like whiskey clubs, tasting wheels, etc. Great. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier that, you know, for some people it, it's, you're born with it, right? But, yeah. um, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't learn how to yes. taste bourbon. Correct. You can develop it. Actually here, we develop or we find, to, some people are just blind to it, which is probably pretty rare to certain characteristics, but it does happen. But we also, when you can identify something, you can get better at it. And so if we, when we do training here, if we're looking for something we don't like, we'll train people on that negative characteristic. When they start, they might not see it. By the time they're done, they see they're quite sensitive to it. But inherently, some people are more sensitive than others to that same characteristic. So we do train based on that, yes. Fascinating. Cool. Good questions. Are we ready to go into the tasting part? Yeah, let's do it. We're getting behind today. Everybody's seen these types of drawings, right? 
So when you do taste, you have those primary tastes, the sweetness, the saltiness, the sourness, and then the dryness and the bitterness towards the back of the palate. And then you have that umami type flavor that you can sense everywhere in your palate, but there's other senses too, that you, or tastes that you can glean off, and, and some of them not written down are the, the cold and the hot, not temperature-wise, but a cooling effect like mint or um, the hot like peppery. And bourbon is really kind of spicy and peppery, so uh, those are tastes that you pick up. And you combine those zones, the primary taste like that, with the aroma that when you taste, you actually define the flavor that way. And again, by breathing in, you, you really aid in that prevention, or that perception, I mean. Um, what else? Any other questions? Yeah, we've got, we've got a, a good question from Zach Brooks. He, he's, he, he says, do you recommend pouring a glass of bourbon and, and letting it sit for a few minutes before nosing and tasting? I, I see you've got your glasses covered. Why do you do that? Yeah, well, we cover it because you don't want it to evaporate too quick because um, for me, the alcohol actually is a carrier too for the flavor, but all that is inside. And if you were to leave this glass all day, it would become spent, the flavor dissipates. Um, but you don't need to wait um, if you pour a glass of bourbon. Um, it'll be fine just to, to, to appreciate it then. The only time that we would wait is if we add water to it. Um, especially if you add a lot. When we taste here, we do add water, so we do wait at least 10 to 15 minutes. When you're adding a drop or two, I don't think it's as significant, but when you add a lot of water, you should wait because there's an exothermic reaction and it takes a little while for that to settle down. Okay, so let's do a taste quickly here. Where's my glass here? We'll try this one, Buffalo Trace. So. You take your first sip. Remember spit, um, not swallow. <laughs> but you know that swirling that I do in my mouth? We call that in Kentucky the Kentucky Chew. And basically you're getting that flavor all over your palate. And all the surfaces such that you can make a good decision on, a, on the quality of that product, especially here when we look at samples. And if you were actually to swallow it, we call that the Kentucky hug. So you can impress your friends with those terminologies. Um, but when you taste, each time you taste, it tells you a story about that whiskey. It's got a beginning, it's got a middle, and it's got an end. So when you taste it, you know, you're gonna get upfront flavors, like you may have some sweetness first. You may have that, you can use your wheel. You may, ha when we say sweetness, you may say, hey, that's like an apple. Or maybe that's a little more like the stone fruits, like an apricot. And then you, and you feel the transition. You just, you just feel it go across your palate and eventually, at the finish, you get that dryness, that oakiness in the back of your palate. And so that will be different for every brand um, that you buy, and it will actually be like a fingerprint because each time you taste it, you'll have that. And so there may be slight variances, especially with single barrel, but that's the, basically the way it works. And so I think we only have a few more minutes I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we do here at Buffalo Trace. So we use the Kupita glass and we do have the cover slip because after we, basically we, here's an example of a, a barrel strength sample. We'll just pour it because it's, we've got three lines on here. We'll pour it up to the first line. And because of the proof being high, if you were to smell and taste this, it might burn you out real quick. We do add water, not to the second line, but to the third line. And what that does is basically brings it down to around that 20% ABV or 40 proof. 
And so you have your standard on one side and you have your sample and we will we'll compare the two. And taste at the same time. So you're looking for a difference from the standard. Now when you have a single barrel you expect some deviation. Um, so that's the hardest part when I first came here to Buffalo Trace 17 years ago is how far apart can they be? Because if it's too far apart it's not that product. It, so that's the hardest thing to get used to because you do want that variation with single barrel. And when we train people that's the hardest thing for them to learn is how much variation is good variation versus uh, consistency because as a blender you want everything to be the same but as a single barrel it's in the same family but it uh, can be a little different. It's a really difficult concept for a lot of people to grasp. The other thing we do and we do a lot of this there'll be 50, 100, 150 samples every day of looking at single barrels. But the other thing we do is triangle test where we put three glasses that I have here. Two will have, say, this case, we'll put the standard here, and then a sample. And we use RO water, which is reverse osmosis, which is demineralized water, basically no minerals. So when we do a triangle, we mark the glasses with numbers on the bottom and then we'll ask people um, to pick out which one is different. So two are the same and one, are, one is different. And so we'll mix the glasses up. And you won't know which is which. That's hard to do with this table. So you don't know which is which and now you smell and taste each one and you have to pick the one that's different. If you can pick the one that's different, then it's, it's different. <laughs> but sometimes you won't, and you'll pick out one of the standards, and you think that's the different one. So that means you can't tell the difference. So we do a statistical analysis on whether you can pick this as a panel. And the panel is uh, trained to do this type of testing. And we do this if we want to make a new standard, uh, things like that. So the triangle test is something we use quite a bit here too. And the last thing that we do is new product development. So you'll have say three components. We're making say a new blended whiskey here. So you'll have these three components and then you'll basically combine them at what you think the percentages should be. and you mix them up and then you evaluate and see if it matches what you think it should be. And so this process here that I'm just showing you is very very simple the way we're doing it but it could have five or six different whiskeys even more with, in terms of whiskeys and each one will bring you a different flavor and then if it matches what you think it, you, you designed out to match, then that'll be fine. But if not, you go back and redo it. So that type of new product development is something we also do here. And just on a final note, just before I finish and wrap up, is the panelists are all trained here, and we consistently test them and making sure that they can all taste what we think they can taste. We the biggest problem or the biggest challenge we always have is the terminology where we get panelists to say this is this characteristic and this is this characteristic but we're all tested here across our organization just to make sure that we can all taste and we all know what we're tasting properly so can't really go much more than that I think the time is pretty short. Very cool well Drew thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today I know there's a lot going on here at the distillery with this right. big expansion. Um, I do want to ask, what is it like seeing all these warehouses going up and knowing there's over a million barrels coming your way? Exciting. It just a lot more work to do. If we do single barrels, we uh, have a lot more work. If we have, for me personally, uh, the new products will be exciting. Cool. I'm really excited. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, well, guys, that's that wraps up today's episode of Whiskey Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, we'll be back next week live at 2 p.m. here at Buffalo Trace Distillery.